And then throughout this, uh, this month, leading up to our big city Christmas event, uh, we're doing a uh, series that we're calling A Christmas Carol. And so what we're doing is, uh, and this was just something that was on my heart, and that was to take a look at where do some of the songs we sing come from uh, and why does it matter? And uh, so today we're going to be taking a look at O Come Emmanuel, and I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, uh, this one is my personal favorite Christmas song every year. Uh, I listen to it on repeat when the kids and my wife aren't around, so if they're gone, I'll throw it on repeat and just listen, especially to the instrumental version of it. I, I don't know why, but it's like, just gets deep inside of me, and I love this song. And, uh, and the reason I say I do it when the kids aren't, aren't around, because they can't do things on repeat. I'm very weird. I can take my favorite song, whatever the new one is, and I can listen to it over and over and over and over and over and over, and it'll drive everybody else crazy, but I can do it, and I love it. And so every year, uh, I really love to uh, pull out this song. One of my favorite versions is done by these two guys called the Piano Guys, and they play it with a cello and a piano. It's beautiful. You should look it up afterwards. But what I'm hoping is that as we take a look at these songs, uh, these carols, that by the end of the service, it will take on new meaning. And that uh, when the band comes up and they lead us in a moment, that we will sing that song with a, a, a new appreciation for the carol. But more importantly, with a deep sense of reverence that it helps connect us, not just us individually to the Lord and not just us as a body to the Lord, but generations of believers, generations of people who have been looking for Jesus. Like this is something that bridges that gap. And so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that in a moment. Uh, and so my slides are not on over here at all, FYI, um, on, the, on the bottom. So if that could get fixed, that would be great. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with this. Uh, so, O, o Come, O Come, Emmanuel uh, translates out of this uh, Latin terminology, Vini, Vini, Emmanuel. And I'm gonna go ahead and point out that you're gonna see some variation of Emmanuel spelled with an I and sometimes with an E. Uh, when it is spelled with an I, it is referencing Emmanuel as transliterated out of Hebrew into English. And when it is uh, with an E, it is because it is transliterated out of the Greek and Latin uh, and, and with an E. And so here we're using Latin, okay, but we're using the I because it is a direct reference to Isaiah. I'll get to that in a moment. But this terminology, Vini, Vini, Emmanuel, uh, Vini in the Latin, it is a command or plea directed to a singular subject, often expressing urgency or longing, okay? And so the, the idea here is that uh, the idea of O Come is not a request, like, hey, I've got an idea, why don't you come home for Christmas? It is more of like, please, I am begging you, you must come. Right, I, I, so, so it's difficult sometimes in English to, to get the urgency uh, uh, of a word, but there is an urgency that is being communicated here, okay? Uh, its origins can be traced to the O antiphons, and so this idea of O, o Come, Emmanuel, this song, it comes back to this, uh, this series of chants that were sung during the last seven days of Advent in the Christian liturgical calendar. So leading up to Christmas, there were these seven, they called them the big O's, the seven big O's, and so so uh, they would focus on a different O each uh, day of the week, and O Come Emmanuel was the one that ended on Christmas Eve. It was the final one, uh, the, the final call. So antiphons are concise chants and usually highlight a particular theme or message from Scripture. Now this, as I was studying all of this, is really just beautiful to me, and I'm hoping to connect some, some pieces for you in a moment. So we, we, we're familiar with the idea of, uh, of chanting, of that style of music. Um, the, the purpose of that was not just so that we would hear a beautiful sound, 
the, the, the people who, who developed that type of singing did it so that they could take a portion of scripture, typically just a very small portion, and say it in a way that would make you meditate on it. So it was a, a learning technique for the community, right? So think in terms of this. We're talking about a style of worship that was really popular throughout medieval times when we do not have access to the written word the way that we would today, right? I mean, you guys all have a digital device. You'll pull it out and you will get your, uh, you'll get your, um, uh, your Bible and you'll look at it, they didn't have that. And so what would happen was there was, it was really important for them to be able to, uh, to be able to, to help people get the word inside of them. Um, and so the hymn, O Come Emmanuel, was translated into English by John, uh, John Mason Neal in 1851 and he, was very careful to maintain the solemn and poetic quality of what had been sung. Now, again, very important for us to understand a point I'll make in just a moment, that, that he was translating it into English. Now, he was a Catholic priest uh, who had, uh, I think in, in what I was reading, he had wanted to be a monk actually and did not qualify for some reason. And as a priest, he was limited because of some type of sickness. There was not a lot of detail in there. So what this guy did was basically spent his entire life taking uh, music that he thought really was good for worship and translating it so that English speaking uh, churches could use that. Um, so the melody commonly associated with the hymn is what's called plain chant uh, with its origins in the 15th century French processional hymn book. And uh, the, they would use this when a nun would pass away, this particular hymn, the plain chant, would be sung at the funeral procession. And so this tune gives the song its haunting, meditative quality. Uh, so this particular song, like I said, it, it resonates really deep inside of me. It definitely brings me to a place where I am very focused on Jesus during the song. And you're probably familiar with plain chant, uh, Gregorian chant, Ambrosian chant, uh, Byzantine chant, and Mozarabic chant. Now, around here, we, are, we hear Gregorian chant. We see the signs for a couple of churches that will do Gregorian chant. And so it's kind of, I think it's a more popular type of chanting, uh, plain chant, if you will. But these are the four primary types of plain chant. Uh, and so the idea, again, you would take a portion of scripture and then it would be sung, okay? And so now here's, here's what I, I wanna help kind of bridge a little bit of a gap on and why Sunday morning worship becomes so important, okay? Um, and, and why we have to be careful with what we do on Sunday morning worship. So the, the, the heart behind plain chant was not to create an environment in which you showed up and you drifted away, right? So it was specifically meant to connect you to the word of God. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with going and listening to Gregorian chant, but Gregorian chant is not going to be in English. The majority of it is going to be in Latin, and you're not going to understand it. And so it's going to create an opportunity for you if you know Jesus and you love Jesus and you have the word of God inside of you, absolutely, you can meditate on Jesus. But if you do not know Jesus, what you are hearing are the reverberations of man in a language that you don't understand. And so this was important to people like Neil who said this needs to be in English so that people when they are singing it can connect to the word of God. Again, I am not trying to downplay the beauty of this. We were having a conversation with friends of mine yesterday about this right here, it is beautiful. It absolutely is soothing and relaxing and it is a great way in which to pray. But the important thing to understand is that if a person does not really know Jesus, it is a very difficult way for them to connect. It is not actually connecting them to any tradition. The tradition was know the word of God. And if we don't know the word of God, we're not connecting to the tradition. Those people who pioneered this type of worship and poured their heart and lives into it were doing it so that you would know the word of God because the word of God mattered. And if we don't get the word of God inside of it, then what we're doing is just tapping into 
what somebody else did instead of into Jesus. And so this is really important to me uh, uh, for us to understand that these songs, right, that we're gonna talk about over the next few weeks, just like O Come Emmanuel here, they, they bridge a span of hundreds and hundreds of years of people gathering together and singing, and they were singing together a message, not just listening to it and absorbing it. So let's take a look at the lyrics. Um, I'm only gonna take a look at the first verse primarily for time's sake, uh, but it says, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. So uh, we talked about O come, O come. This is this idea of urgency that's taking place. And so the, 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 the song is saying, we desperately need you to show up. Why is it a desperation? This is a desperation because of the condition or the position of the individual, right? I am here in my life and things are not going the way maybe that I thought they would go or I'm not, I'm not in the position that I would like to be in. But nevertheless, the world around me is so desperate for Jesus, please just come. Please just go ahead and show up. Go ahead and send the Son of God to be with us. And then it comes to this word, Emmanuel. Uh, if we look at Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14, it says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us. And so I love this picture, right? Uh, this is my favorite way to illustrate this, that we are in the garden and there is a, a falling away. There is a sin nature that grabs onto humanity. And because of that, there is a fracturing. And what happens? There is a promise that is made that one day, some descendant of Eve's will crush the head of the serpent. What does that mean? Well, we don't know what it means at that point, right? We're in Genesis, we're reading this. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And I believe that in the heavenly host of all of creation, that the angels and the fallen angels and any other beings that exist out there, they also don't know anything other than this prophetic word. And it's not until the prophet Isaiah gets a download from God that all of a sudden the heavens are ringing. Have you heard God's going himself? It's not just going to be that some man is gonna be born and he's gonna be a really good guy and somehow he's gonna figure it out, right? No, 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 God is showing up himself. And so I just, I just imagine that the angels are whispering, what does this mean? How is God going to go himself? Matthew reverberates this in chapter one, verse 23, quoting back to Isaiah, helping us to understand the prophetic nature of Isaiah. And, it's, and he, so he, he repeats it. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so from the prophet Isaiah, we hear God showing up to Matthew, him reminding us, God said he's coming in the flesh. That's the man who's walking right here. It's Jesus. And so in the garden, the relationship with God was broken and we were removed from his presence. So God comes to where we are to restore the relationship. We fall, our nature removes us from his presence, and what does he do? He figures out a way to come to where we are at. He shows up in that place. The language here, it goes on, it says, and ransom captive Israel. What does it mean to ransom? Well, this is uh, 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 an idea that, communicates that we're indebted by our sin, that we are held hostage, that we are enslaved. When a person does not know Jesus, their sin becomes the anchor by which they are driven away from God. And it's when we identify that our nature and our decision-making, it is what creates destruction in our lives, and so we need God and we need his instruction that all of a sudden we go, God, I surrender to you, and that we are set free from that. I, I was having this conversation yesterday, literally with my, with my wife, and we were talking about somebody who we know who is in a, in a state of what appears to just be really great de depression right now. And the reason for that depression is because this individual has made some catastrophic decisions. 
They've made some decisions that have put them in a place where they really might lose everything. And it's very difficult from the outside to have a lot of sympathy because so many people got hurt by those decisions and yet this person now feels all alone. And it's obvious as you're looking at it. And I told her, I said, it's, so, it's so, such a good mirror of why God's word matters why he gives instruction that may not be convenient and comfortable in the moment and you might not like the instruction that it's giving you and culture might go, well, I reject that, I don't like it. But here's what I promise you, I promise you that if you will walk it out, no matter how uncomfortable it is today, when you begin to bear fruit from it, you will find that you have been set free, that a ransom has been paid and where you could be in a place of depression and oppression and stress and destruction in your life, you will find that there is a path to freedom. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, right? So Jesus comes, right? God in the flesh. He didn't come to, to be lifted up in a way that we just carry him around on a throne, but instead he showed up to meet our needs and to give his life as a ransom for many. A price had to be paid, so God comes in the flesh, and what does he do? He dies on the cross. Why? To set us free. To set us free. Look here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse five, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So Paul writing to Timothy says that Jesus came and he paid a ransom for us. A debt that we owed, he paid. A debt that we should have had to carry and, and, and somehow figure out, he showed up and met. And so, the song says, ransom captive Israel. What is captive Israel? Well, we can look at this from one of two perspectives and I think that it's fully appropriate for us as Protestant, Gentile Christians. Great. <laughs> All right, it's back. All right, historic or inclusive? We can look at it from a historic or an inclusive perspective. So what do I mean by historic? Well, here's what we understand. Israel has been uh, taken away. They're in captivity. They have been removed from their land. Uh, and at the point that Jesus actually shows up, they are themselves uh, under Roman rule. They cannot live their lives the way that they would like to, right? And so there is a longing that they know that a Messiah is showing up. And we know from historical text that this is a very firm reality that they are looking for the Messiah, so much so that there are many false messiahs. We hear stories of, of, of people rising up, calling themselves the Messiah, leading people out into the desert, and people dying of starvation. But then Jesus shows up. And Jesus is followed by signs and wonders, unlike the, those who were who had come before claiming to be Messiah. So everyone's looking for the Messiah. Jesus shows up, Emmanuel, God with us. And so there is, a, there is some proof that he is who he says he is. So we can look at it from that historic perspective or inclusive as we, the, the, the church today, are grafted into the greater story of Israel. Now, we know that there is a new covenant. We're under the new covenant. There is an unfulfilled old covenant with Israel. And so the Israel, the people, the Hebrew people, they have a, a covenant that God made with them that has not yet been fulfilled. And so we get into Revelation and that's some of the parsing that we have to do. There are things that are taking place that will matter for the Hebrew people and then there are things that will matter for the, the greater church at large. But in the end, and hear me now, in the end when we stand in eternity, right, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. When it comes to eternity, we are brothers and sisters with all of humanity. And so we absolutely can understand the plight of historic Israel as the church today. And then the, 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 the writer goes on and says, so ransom captive Israel, and what is the state of Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God 
up here. And so there's this like emotional state that is matched with a reality that, that they are exiled, that they're not accepted, that the thing that they believe is not the modern popular culture of the day that yes, there may be other Hebrew people and there may be families that gather together and yes, they may sing and dance and enjoy times of worship together, but in the greater scheme of the world, there is a great rejection that takes place and so there is an exiling a, and a, 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 a sense of loneliness at times, but that is all undone when the Son of God appears. And so, for centuries, the people of Israel lived in anticipation of God's promise. A savior would rescue them and restore their relationship with him. This is the, the state that, that we find ourselves in, is that we anticipate that the furthering of God's promise is that he will come and rescue and restore our relationship with him, that Jesus will soon return. There will be an establishing of a new heaven and a new earth. And so there's something about connecting this, this hope we have in the sky splitting open and Jesus coming in, right, to rescue and redeem and save us all with the fact that there was a portion of the church that was just longing for the babe to show up. They were just looking for the initial presence for God to show up in the flesh. And so just as they longed for Emmanuel, today we long for Emmanuel. And for me, there's something that connects me to that idea and therefore connects me to that. Like I can feel the feelings that they must have felt in those days, like I can connect and understand what it must have been like to, to be traveling on that day trying to meet the deadline for a census, understanding that there was a baby to be born, that the world would change. The lyrics will go on in the other verses and they call for the rod of Jesse to free them from Satan's tyranny and for the key of David to open the gates of heaven. You see, the longing was not passive, it was active, rooted in faith and trust in God's promises. And so for me, as we step into the Christmas season, there are so many things that I love about it. One of my favorite things is that it gives me the opportunity to have just some really good quality time with my family. I'm fully, fully aware of the fact that my children are growing up. They're going to begin to have families of their own and they're going to begin to long if they continue to love Jesus. They're going to continue to long for the gathering of family. And one day they'll have kids and grandkids and they'll be longing for their family to be connected. And so I, I, I see such a generational longing that takes place and Christmas just reminds me of that. And it reminds me of being a part of a great multi-generational longing for all of us to be redeemed and restored and for the world to be made right. You see, for the Israelites, every moment of hardship, every exile, every oppression was met with the hope of Emmanuel, God with us. And this is the hope that I hope you're met with. Listen, if you're, if you're just in life and you find yourself sometimes just feeling like, what's the point or why is this happening? Can, what would it look like if you were to pause and go, this is more evidence that Jesus is needed in my life. What would it look like if we could learn to walk through hardship and instead of allowing it to make us bah humbug, if, what if we said, this is difficult, I'm not enjoying this, but I have hope that this will be ended, that I will find freedom because there is a God who came and died for my sins and he is soon returning. The hope to get through the difficult situation. You see, today, much like Israel was waiting for the coming of Jesus, we now wait for his return. 
and so many Christmas carols will do this for us, will help us to connect to this message. This song for me does just that. It reminds me that I am waiting for Jesus to split the sky and for all things to be made new. This song is not just a song about the past, but it, but also about the future future that all of those who love Jesus will take part in. All of those who have surrendered their lives will take part in. And I'll end with this as we prepare to sing, that it is a song about waiting in darkness. I I was talking with my daughter the other day and we were talking about Marley and me. And uh, that I, it's a, a, a movie about a dog, right? It's like the modern old yeller is what they were describing it as. I didn't know that when I watched it and I cried for hours. And we were talking about how like there's enough, I can be sad on my own. That was the, the com- comment, right? I, there is plenty to be sad about. I do not need a movie to do that to me, right? And so she was, had no interest in ever watching the movie. I wouldn't let her watch it when she was younger. Uh, it was like right there next to any horror movie. I was like, You're, no, we're not watching that, right? We're not doing that to you. Uh, uh, there's no reason for it in your life. Um, why? Because darkness is just a part of life. There is just, it's just a reality that you're gonna go through seasons where there are, you're gonna have a difficult moment. Someone you love is going to be lost. They're gonna be in a position of pain. You may even find yourself in that position, but there is hope. And this song for me is about waiting in the darkness and clinging to the light of his promise. And his promise is that he died for you. If you don't know Jesus as Lord of your life, and if you're not living your life in such a way as to cling to that hope, can I just tell you something? You're just missing out. If you're out going, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but you're living like hell, you are disconnected from the hope. You are waiting in darkness, clinging to something else, and maybe believing there is a hope, but it's not the thing that you're clinging to. And maybe like so many generations before us, we could sing this song and cling to the hope that Jesus is soon to return. Will you stand and will you just take time now as we end our service to just sing, to be connected with saints beyond this life in declaring that we need God with us?